everyone. My name is Mayuka Vidari. I'm a senior software engineer at Ripple, and today I'll be talking to you about smart escrows. Julia did a better job of summarizing my talk than I did, but um, yeah. So let's start with uh, a little bit of background so that you know what I'm going to be talking about here. So, smart, so first off, what are escrows? So escrows uh, are essentially a contract with certain agreed upon terms. You have a transfer of money from one party to another, and there's some terms on how that transfer of money works. And these terms are usually, you can't really change them later because it's a contract. And the XRPL actually has a built-in primitive for this that you can already use. So this, this is sort of an example of what it looks like. Uh, it's essentially you, you're sending funds from one account to another, from the origin to the destination. It's an all or nothing release, so either you're transferring all these funds all at once, or you don't transfer anything at all. It, right now, it can only hold XRP. There's support coming soon for other, other token standards, IOUs and MPTs. Um, and there are two forms of release. You can do time-based, so after a certain amount of time, you can release the funds, or condition-based. This is often known as a hash lock in other ecosystems, but essentially it's you provide a password and the escrow will unlock and those funds will be released. So in a diagram form, this is what it looks like and how it works. You uh, have your origin account. You submit an escrow create transaction to create the escrow with all of the various parameters that were on the previous slide, such as the amount, what release conditions you want to use, that sort of thing. And if you want to finish the escrow, you use the escrow finish transaction, uh, which tra transfers those funds to the destination. Or you can use the escrow cancel transaction if your escrow is cancelable to essentially send those funds back to the origin. So now, what are XRPL extensions? Extensions are a new paradigm that we've come up with for bringing programmability to the XRPL. The XRPL has been around for, for 13 years now. We don't really want it to uh, have issues because it's a billion dollar network. But programmability is important. Um, and so how can we approach this and have a way in which we can have programmability on the XRPL without endangering all of the, the value that already exists there? So extensions allow us to do this in a little bit more of a granular way, in a little bit more of a step-by-step -step way, so we still have a lot of functionality without necessarily going, going too big too fast. So an XRPL extension is a small piece of code that attaches to an XRPL building block, which just allows users to add some additional custom logic or business logic to the existing XRPL primitives. This can be very useful for projects that uh, you know, they think the ex existing ex features of the XRPL are super great, but maybe need a little bit of a minor modification to make it work for their use case. And this is essentially the best of both worlds, because you do get a lot of benefits out of the existing building blocks on the XRPL. They're fast, efficient, uh, well-designed, well-tested, audited. You don't need to redo all of that, reinvent the wheel with, say, a smart contract. So what is a smart escrow? A smart escrow allows developers to essentially write their own custom release conditions for an escrow. It's essentially combining the two topics that we just had in the background. You have your smart escrows and your extensions. You add those together, you get, so you, sorry, you have your escrows and your extensions. You combine those together and you get smart escrows. So the one direction in which we wanted to expand escrows that we thought would be uh, very useful without um, exposing too much risk would be custom release conditions for escrows. So as I discussed on the previous slide, you, can have, you currently have time-based and condition-based releases. This essentially allows you to add a third release condition that can do whatever you want, whatever your custom code uh, uh, does. So some examples might be um, temporary holds. You can hold some funds that you want to send to somebody, but they need to be KYC checked or something like that before they can actually receive those funds. Uh, another example is delivery versus payment, or DVP. Um, essentially, you're holding payment until a delivery of goods or services is made. So if I'm, say, buying a new TV, I want to make sure I receive that TV before I actually pay them. But the person selling me the TV also wants to be sure that I have the funds to pay them and that I'm not going to uh, sort of 
screw them over by not actually sending them, them that money after I get my TV. And the third example here is token swaps. So essentially, these are trustless token swaps where two, the release of two escrows are dependent on each other. So the way that you actually write these uh, is with WebAssembly or WASM, which is a binary code format. Many programming languages have compilers that allow you to write code in that language and then compile it down into WASM. But it's most convenient from languages like, like Rust, which is a little bit of the best of both worlds of has good tooling for WASM and is also decently human readable. So this is a little bit of what, about, uh, of what it might look like. You have your account that's sending the escrow, the amount, which in this case is uh, 0.1 XRP. The escrow is cancelable at a certain time. It's, it, you can store a little bit of data alongside it that, the, uh, that your code can use. Uh, it has a destination. And it can only unlock when after a, certain, after a certain time, which is that finish after value. And when that finish function uh, code, that uh, giant block there, says that, you can finish, so says that the escrow can be released. So essentially, what this looks like is it's a, a function that says yes or no, can this escrow be released. So revisiting our diagram earlier, where this works is you, when you create your escrow, you upload the code alongside with it. It essentially becomes a part of your contract uh, that you're creating when you're um, creating your escrow. And the code is executed when you try to finish the escrow. So that's when all of your release conditions are checked. You check, uh, you know, is it has the, is the right time? Has there been enough time that's passed for it to be released? Uh, is there a condition on it? Do I need a password to release it? And does my new uh, code block say that I can release the escrow? So here's a little bit of a basic uh, function and what that might look like. Uh, it written in Rust, you can see that there's a single function here. It's called finish, and it returns a Boolean true or false. Essentially, can this escrow be released or not? Um, there's a little bit of a, of a standard library that contains an API for what information you can um, what, what, what information you can access and from the XRPL to fetch, to fetch data. Uh, in this case, you can get the escrow uh, account ID and destination. And all this does is uh, essentially ensure that only the, escrow, the, the account that created the escrow can release it. So just a basic example to show what the code looks like a little bit. And so now, just let's just go through these examples. How might you actually do these? It might be, it's, it's a little confusing at first. So revisiting the examples that I had on the previous slide. Temporary holds. So this essentially is you want to hold funds for compliance checks. I'm sending a payment to you, but I'm a regulated entity. So until you're verified to you know, not be a terrorist and, be some, and not be from a country that has sanctions on it and all of that sort of thing, I can't actually send you money. But you want to know that I'm going to send you money. And so I can create a, a smart escrow that essentially checks that essentially waits for some sort of on-chain confirmation of, yes, this person has been KYC'd. You are allowed to send them money. So some ways you might be implementing this is you can create an escrow that only releases if the destination account has a specific credential from a specific issuer. This might be a third party that you work with that um, does compliance checks. And so once there's an on-chain verification of this KYC, the, the es escrow can be released. And you could do this with a credential, or you could do it with an NFT that contains the data of what this uh, KYC information might look like. Uh, another way, a little bit of a simpler way you could do it is also just have this third party be the only account that can release this escrow that vouches essentially for the trustworthiness of the destination. And this is essentially a, a notary escrow. Um, yeah. And our second example, delivery versus payment. You're essentially holding payments until a delivery of goods or services is made. So you might do this as the delivery recipient confirms that the delivery was received. You could have a third party that maybe, it was, maybe it's the company that did the delivery uh, that vouches for that delivery. And, or the delivery could even be tracked on chain. Like, for example, if the good that you're transferring is an NFT, you could just check, has this NFT been transferred or not? Um, 
or, or you could do it via some sort of Oracle system. You could have a, a trusted Oracle that keeps track of whether this delivery has been made successfully. And then the escrow is just released based on once that's been confirmed on chain. And our third example, token swaps. So this is essentially trustless, uh, a, a trustless token swap where the escrow's release depend on each other. So the way I thought about implementing this was you have your first escrow can only be released once your second escrow is created. So there now both escrows exist. And so uh, you create both escrows. You can release escrow A once escrow B is created. And escrow B can only be finished once escrow A is finished. And that's, that's one way that you could sort of link the two together. So I had this slide, and then I was told there are no microphones for you guys to actually answer my questions. So I'm going to leave this as an exercise to the reader of you guys just think about what ideas you can uh, come up with, and maybe at me on Twitter slash X on what creative ideas you come up with, because I'd love to hear it. Uh, so yeah, now I'm just going to give you a basic demo. The demo that I'm going to walk through here is essentially a basic KYC example. So I'm going to be creating an escrow that can only be released if the destination has a certain, for simplicity purposes, terms and conditions escrow, uh, sorry, terms and conditions credential that they just create themselves for themselves. And um, you know, this could be for something like maybe uh, there's some compliance reason that you need some terms and conditions to be accepted, and that can be recorded on chain via a credential. So the way that I, I'm going to be doing this is we have this tool called Craft that essentially allows me to write um, write these smart escrows in Rust and compile them into into WebAssembly. So can you guys read this in the back? Do I need to zoom in at all? I'm going to take that as a yes. So I can build my KYC example here. And I want it to be really small, so I'm going to use all the aggressive filters here. And then uh, I don't need to export that, because I've got other scripts to do that for me. And now uh, I was having some connectivity issues. Let's see if they're fixed or if I just get lucky. So I have this script that will, uh, so on, this, on the right side of the screen, I have the Wasm DevNet where uh, you can test and deploy all sorts of uh, practice test smart escrows. Um, since everybody who is obviously at this talk, and I don't see a lot of laptops, nobody else is submitting transactions. So let's change that. Uh, I'm going to deploy this sample, and it's going to be the KYC example. Uh, we just connected. Now we've got to create a couple accounts. Takes a second. OK, we can see one payment here. So that's our first transaction, create, our first account created. And then here's the second one. We've got the details here. I know I'm sharing my seed here, but it's on a DevNet, so the money's all fake. <laughs> um, OK, and before it scrolls away, let's get this escrow create. Uh, so as you can see, this escrow create has successfully passed. And it's got this giant finish function attached. If I go to the raw uh, tab, you can see the whole thing here. It's this giant, uh, giant blob of text that essentially is my complete escrow finish function. And so now that I've created it, uh, I can release it. And so it can be canceled um, in 40 minutes. And it can be finished after, yeah, it can be finished now. Cool. So um, let's try to finish it. So I have a separate script that will do that. Uh, and I need to get the destination account and the seed for the destination account. And then I need the escrow information, which is the account that created the escrow, and the sequence number of the transaction where the escrow was created. And so here's our transaction details. 
So this transaction is going to fail because I haven't created that credential. I told you I needed to finish this escrow. So it did indeed fail. And now we're going to create that credential. And now we've created this credential. And so now it should succeed to finish this escrow. And there we go. So uh, I was going to show you on the Explorer, but I forgot. So we're going to go back. Um, where's our account? So here's the destination. So we can see the escrow finish. This is the first uh, transaction that failed with the same error code, tech was and rejected. And then the credential was created. And the credential type is terms and conditions, as I said earlier. And then the escrow. After creating that credential, the escrow finish then does succeed, and uh, the destination did indeed receive those funds. So um, what this code looks like is uh, a little bit like this. So essentially, first you get the escrow destination, and then you calculate, OK, what does this object ID look like? for this credential if the subject is the destination, the issuer is the destination, and the credential type is terms and conditions. And then we've got just a quick logging statement. And then we check this essentially, this transaction is essentially checking, does this object exist? And if it does, then we can return successfully. Otherwise, if it doesn't exist, we do not return, and this transaction cannot finish. And this logging will show up in the, the Ripple D uh, debug log, which um, I guess I don't, have I don't have access to on the DevNet. Uh, but if you run Ripple D locally, you, you can debug pretty easily uh, what, the, what these details all look like. So that's, uh, that's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you.